The old saying goes, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. And I think for long-standing TNA fans, this probably holds true. For years, there was frustration with Dixie Carter, her leadership, the direction of the company, the future of the company on so many different levels to where many thought that if Dixie was finally pushed out the door and there was new leadership, new ownership that came into being for this company, that this company would have a real fighting chance to at least, if nothing else, be viable for many years to come. Maybe improve, maybe get better, maybe become a more profitable entity or profitable at all, and most certainly um, not be in the position that it is now. And I think it comes back to, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. Because for all the things we could say about Dixie Carter, and many of them being true, and even if you still, in part, want to blame the current state of this company, whatever the hell you want to call it, on Dixie Carter and some of the failures of her leadership over a decade plus of TNA, Impact Wrestling, whatever, that's fine. Because ultimately, the decisions made, the choices made, put the company in a really, really bad hole. But in spite of all of those flaws, this is the same Dixie Carter that did help take this company from doing weekly pay-per-views to a Fox Sports Net television deal to two hours prime time every Thursday night on Spike TV, a major national cable television network that had distribution in over 90 million homes. She took a brand that got to a point where it was averaging 1.1 to 1.3 million viewers for a period of time. And even when it wasn't that big in the ratings, it was still hovering around a million viewers, uh, maybe to 1.1 million viewers. You had big viable names there. Yes, it was part of the problem. The flaw of the company was they relied so much on the stars of the past, of yesterday, instead of trying to make new stars and stars for tomorrow. But this was still a company that when they would go do a UK tour, they could cram thousands of people into the O2 arena. They could do shows in different places when they got out of the impact zone and draw several thousand people. This is a company that could do a few thousand people for their monthly pay-per-views. Usually it would be the big four that they would do outside of the impact zone. And they used to be able to reasonably afford doing monthly pay-per-views. And perhaps that was unsustainable. Perhaps that was Panda Energy continuing to dump money into the product at a loss and that artificially propped it up and made it look better for a longer period of time. But ultimately, there was a point in time where you could at least say, even if you didn't enjoy the product, even if you didn't like the product, even if you didn't like the company, you didn't like Dixie, you didn't like her leadership, the creative direction of the thing, you could at least say they were a viable company. Well, certainly they were not a competitor of WWE, but they were a viable company. You know, let's be honest, there are a lot of wrestling companies now that wish they had two hours of national primetime television on Thursday night that could get them a million plus viewers. There are plenty of wrestling shows that would love nothing more than to be able to do an event outside of their television taping location and get a few thousand people to come and do that a few times a year and impact that show used to be able to do that. TNA used to be able to do that for all of its flaws and idiosyncrasies and flat out stupidities. Not everything was terrible about the Dixie Carter regime. You know, in fact, the company, even to this day, to come to this point and be able to bitch about the company, it might not have ever existed anywhere near that long if it wasn't for Dixie Carter and the massive infusion of cash that she brought to the place. So for all of those that thought that Dixie Carter was so bad, and, and to be fair, I was one of those ones that said that, you know, while Dixie had her positives, and I would point out the positives, I would also point out the massive negatives that were associated with her leadership on several different levels. Ultimately, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Because I now I look at Anthem taking over this product, this brand. I look at Anthem's leadership 
And I say, what the hell is happening with Impact Wrestling? What in the world is going on here? You know, from the stupidity of trying to merge with Jeff Jarrett, bring him back into the fold because you got a hold of something you really didn't understand, so you thought bringing somebody in from the past was a good idea with all his issues and problems. No, apparently you didn't do the research to find out he was a stumbling, bumbling, fumbling drunk now. To merging with somebody who had a brand that recorded television tapings, pilot episodes, to try and get a television deal and was never able to do so. A guy that sat there and hocked some pyramid scheme of Jarrett Gold on his freaking GFW website, not understanding all along the idiots at Anthem, and that's what I will call them, idiots at Anthem, that everything about GFW was a ridiculous vanity project for the Memphis Midcard piece of crap founder Jeff freaking Jarrett. The mere fact that you would want to go back into business with this guy was astounding to me because initially it was Jeff Jarrett that put the company in a place where Dixie Carter and her parents and her family's money had to come in and save it and that's true. He's the one that kept bringing in Vince Russo. He's the one that forced himself on top for so many years. He's the one that was a part of so much and so many bad decisions and so many bad choices. So you wanted to bring him in? And then you wanted to merge with him to only then not merge with him? Part of the major issue now, when you talk about quality leadership, it is knowing even if you don't always agree with it, you know there is a path, a vision, and a direction. And for the most part, since Anthem has taken over this wrestling company, I have no clue what the hell is going on. And frankly, I don't think a lot of people do too. We might have some inkling about the direction they are trying to go, but we cannot see where that is a really viable path, vision, or direction for the company. Trying to make this some modern day NWA horse shit. And that's exactly what it is. Why in the hell would you want to pattern yourself after a brand that last saw its viability three damn decades ago? Beats the hell out of me. But we're getting now to Bound for Glory this Sunday. And a show, admittedly, that a couple of months ago I had fully planned on watching. And at this point in time, I'm not sure. I'm 50-50 on the fence on whether or not I'm going to order it and watch it. And I'm leaning towards no at this point. And it has nothing to do with the fact that I haven't watched the shows live in a few weeks. And I've had to catch up on them via tape. That I haven't reviewed them in a few weeks. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the fact that I don't know... If I like the direction this company is going, I don't know if I agree with it. I don't know if I understand it. I don't know if I get it. And I frankly don't know if I want to waste my time with it anymore. Because here's what I'm going to say. Right before arguably your biggest show of the year, you've got all these people that are leaving. Now you could say some are being released and that's true. Many are not. Many are choosing to leave. Many are requesting to leave. And sure, you will still have that rare TNA Impact Wrestling apologist out there that will try to spin this as something sunshiny and something great. But I, I'm telling you at this point, if you've got so many people leaving before your biggest show of the year, which would seem to be a bad, inopportune time to do so, combined with some of the other issues that I'll talk about here in a second in terms of Bound for Glory and doing your tapings, doing your pay-per-view in Canada... It suggests that there are major problems afoot and that people are eager and anxious to jump off the sinking ship. Because I look at it from a leadership standpoint, I get perhaps the philosophy of what this company is trying to do in terms of cutting all the referees so that way you lose local guys in Canada and you save production costs. Um, doing your shows from Canada, maybe perhaps long-term basing your company out of Canada, so that way you can get some type of incentives and tax breaks from the Canadian government, which would perhaps save you some money. I get it. And if anything else, what this company is doing is going beyond just a financial reorganization. This is a company that clearly is losing a lot of money because if companies are doing well, they're not voluntarily going about and doing this type of stuff. 
unless they are making so much money hand over fist that greed starts to set in and they try to maximize the blood that they're able to squeeze out of the turnip, so to speak. But we all know, don't kid yourself, that Anthem with this Impact Wrestling brand, they're bleeding money. They're not making money like that. And you can't tell me they are. Just, there is nothing about this company, nothing about the vibe, nothing about anything that is an indication that they are making money. Period. Point blank. But think about the stupidity of doing your shows in Canada, knowing that you have certain people like a Taryn Terrell, like a Jim Cornette, that you have spent several months featuring on television like they're a big part of your program, only to then ultimately not be able to have them go to Canada, so you basically have no purpose for them in the company anymore. Like, who can't foresee this as a problem? Who are the idiots that sign off on these decisions to sit there and say this, knowing that perhaps you're going to start shifting your operations more towards Canada, perhaps even becoming a Canadian-based company down the road? Why would you bring in people and make them a bigger part of your programming when you know they can't go to Canada, can't get into Canada? And then you got the Ty Valkyrie situation. We just found out that another match you had devoted television time to building up with her and Rosemary at Bound for Glory. Now that match isn't happening, but because you're concerned about visa issues, about her being able to get in and out of the country. I mean, we thought Dixie Carter's decision making and Dixie Carter's leadership was lax and bad. What the hell does it say about Ed Nordholm and the Anthem crew that this basic fundamental stuff, these important yet small details that good, well-run companies wouldn't miss on, this company is consistently missing on? I got news for you. They're bringing people into the fold only a couple of months later to release them. That means that either A, they brought in people for the hell of it and didn't really have a plan, and or B, they can't afford to keep them around, even if it doesn't mean that they're paying them very much. That would be more of an indication. You've got these people jumping off and the ship, and they are. They are jumping off the ship. If the company's not releasing them, they're wanting the hell out of the Dodge. What the hell do you think is going on here? I mean, and at this point in time, it's one of these things of it feels like this company is dead. Not necessarily in a literal sense. They technically will exist and probably will still continue to exist because right now, based off of what I'm seeing out of Anthem, they're not very good business people. So instead of being able to sell this product, which again comes into the greater question of the wisdom of why in the hell did you buy this stinker to frickin' begin with, if that doesn't give you an indication of the lax uh, business talent, business pedigree, business intelligence, and decision making, for an anthem, then I don't know what the hell does. Like, who would look at this company who's lost over two thirds of its viewership and more over the past couple of years that doesn't have anywhere near the star power and the drawing power in terms of talent, doesn't have nearly the quality of television deal, has so many other things going wrong. Who the fuck looks at this lemon, sits there and says it's a good business decision to buy it? Nobody with any type of decent business sense whatsoever, that's who. And for the impact bots, if that doesn't appease you, then I don't give a crap. You're living in your own delusional world. You know damn good and well, putting your markdom aside for the company, and there is nothing wrong with having markdom for the company, but at some point in time, logic has to set in. You cannot tell me logically that if you had the capability to buy that POS, and that's exactly what it was, it was a POS lemon of a wrestling company and everybody damn good and well knew it. You can't tell me that you would sit there from a business standpoint, want to go in on that sinking ship. It's ridiculous. This company is figuratively dead. It's not like I said, it's not literally dead because they still technically exist. But you're gonna to get to the point where it's gonna be so much about showing people from AAA and Pro Wrestling Noah and all these other places because ultimately you don't have to pay them as much. You don't have to be on the hook for any type of downside guarantees or anything like that whatsoever that this company is going to be a shell of what it once was. It's going to be an unrecognizable shell. And sure, there are going to be those that probably spin this as potentially a positive thing. Oh, this is just cost-cutting measures. The WWE is doing it. You cannot even compare the two situations. While I've talked about the WWE and 
their looseness with the books and their misleading, distorting financial figures, you cannot compare the WWE's financial situation and when they release two or three talents and cut back on other expenses compared to Impact Wrestling, who has released all of their referees, several other talents, and not to mention all these other people that are trying to jump ship and have jumped ship successfully. And this company is not even really putting up that much of a fight because ultimately it doesn't matter to Anthem at this point because everybody that leaves is one less person they have to pay. They are doing their stuff up in Canada and organizing stuff to try and take advantage of Canadian tax cuts. Just think about that for a second. Is that something that a solid, uh, sound business or in particular wrestling company would be doing at this point in time? I think we know the answer to that. So at this point in time, it comes back to the major reason that I stopped watching this company a couple of years ago is I felt like it was a sinking ship and I felt like it was going to die. And even if it still existed, it can still exist and for all intents and purposes be dead. And when I'm looking at this crap now, that's exactly what I see. A company that might not be literally dead, but for all intents and purposes is largely figuratively dead because of just so many different things. And it's really hard to sit there and justify making any type of emotional investment or time or financial investment into a company that you don't know how much longer you can sit there and be bothered to watch or support any damn ways. And who knows, maybe I'll get the impulse come tomorrow night, I'll get really incredibly, 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 incredibly massively bored, and maybe I will watch Bound for Glory. But at this point in time, there's been so many moving parts, I don't even know what the hell is all on this card, and what I had seen on the card initially didn't look all that exciting to me to damn begin with. It just shouldn't be this way. And I, I can't imagine that it's this hard. But it is once again a perfect example of bad business people, bad business people, bad business people, bad leadership, terrible leadership, horrible leadership that leads to awful, ridiculously dumb decision making that leads to a position like this. Like I cannot remember in my lifetime and let me take that back. Maybe 1990 AWA in terms of a company that had a big name at one point in time that got to that point that you knew for all intents and purposes it was dead. R.I.P. buried dead. And it was clearly obvious as you watched it. I look at this now and there is no reason for hope. There is no reason to be positive at this point in time. Ask the people that have worked there. Ask the people that have been there. That will tell you all you need to know. Ask all the people that are choosing to cut ship, jump ship, leave. Just look at it. Look at how many people they're releasing. This is not something that a company in a decent position with a good solid foundation and possibilities of the future is going to do. It's like they're trying to delay the Grim Reaper of wrestling at this point in time. And I don't know what it is. It's like people view this brand, this company, it's like a virus. And when people buy it, they get addicted, they get hooked, and they can't live without the virus. But sometimes you got to cleanse that, you got to do what you can to get that virus out of your system. Take some antibiotics, get some shots, do something. You got to get over it. And I think I'm at that point in time where I'm going to go back to getting over it and getting that virus out of my system because what I look at now is a shell of a wrestling company that just exists to be there 